Hey, how you doing? Hey, I am doing well. Uh, it's been kind of a crazy week. Lots of odd hours that I got forced into work, and I had to work a night shift the other day for the first time in a couple of years. And wow, that's disorienting for your whole week to flip over and work a night shift and then come back to the day shift world. But mm. I am working my way through that with stinging eyes and lots of coffee. And otherwise, life is pretty good. Yeah, well, I am glad you're here and I'm glad you have coffee. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so if I don't make sense at any part today, just tell me so. We'll edit it back out and uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Sounds like a plan to me. So how are you? I am doing pretty well. I just had an experience that is a first for me as an adult that most Christians typically have had. We are in the middle of deciding what church we're going to land at, and I sat down and met with the pastor of one of the two churches earlier today, and I haven't met with a pastor before as a potential or actual parishioner. That was a first for me, which is super weird. I'm so curious, were you able to be in the moment or were you evaluating how he was doing his side because you've done his side so much? I was able to be in the moment and it felt very awkward and uncomfortable, to be quite honest. Oh. Uh, I It felt very vulnerable and transparent. He is a delightful person, by the way, and anything that I say has nothing to do with him. It is just clear evidence of what was going on in my heart. But it was interesting to watch my own insecurities, my own self-judgment come up as I was talking with him about the work we're doing with uh, the refuge and things like that. And so it was very interesting. That is fascinating. You know, I just started my counseling program, and one of the things that has been said a couple of times is this concept of you need to know as a counselor what it's like to be a client. and. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're getting that experience in the church world in this moment. And that's so fascinating. Yeah, that's exactly what it felt like. I was like, oh, okay. This is what it feels like to walk into the pastor's office. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. But uh, I'm assuming you didn't call uh, just about that. What's on your mind? Okay. So last week we joked as though we had paused last week's recording and recorded another episode. Clearly, we did not do that. But with the hindsight of a week having gone by, I would like to revisit something that we did say we were very interested in. And that was the topic of sin. And mm. basically, what is our relationship with sin? How should we conceive of it? How should we live in light of it? And this is kind of a heavy topic sometimes, but it doesn't feel too heavy to me. Uh, you know what? Actually, let me take that back. It didn't feel heavy until we prayed. When we, you and I, we always pray the exact same prayer. And for the benefit of our listeners, let me just read real briefly. This is the prayer we pray before we hit record every single time. O Lord, from whom all good things do come. Grant to us, thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that be good, and here's the part that got me, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I realized in that moment, as we were praying just a moment ago, whatever it is that God does in this moment, in this conversation, if we hit upon some ethical mandate for how we should live in light of our sinfulness. I just asked that God would help us live that way. That actually does feel a little heavy. So mm. at any rate, I do want to talk about this idea of total depravity or sinfulness. And are we overemphasizing that in the church? Are we underemphasizing that? How should we respond to this idea of being sinful human beings? Man, I think this is a great question. I think it's, how should we respond and how do we live out of this idea that yeah. acknowledges that we're we're sinful human beings, right? Yeah. 
So even last week when this came up, it really struck a chord with you. And you said something like you had been already thinking about this or something like that. What has this currently on your mind? Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I've I've mentioned this sermon series so many times now. A couple of weeks ago, we had a sermon series at our church on Sabbath. And by the way, I have posted the links where you can go to our church's YouTube channel and watch these uh, services. And so they're in our show notes. If you are interested in this sermon series that I keep referencing, feel free to dive in. But one of the things mm. that you'll see in there, in the very first introductory sermon, our pastor acknowledged the debate that happens around the idea of Sabbath. And one of the debates that happens is, is Sabbath required for Christians? It was part mm -hmm. of the Ten Commandments. It was something that was required for Israel. But the same requirement does not appear to be restated in the New Testament. So if we do not practice Sabbath, are we sinning? And those who say no say, but it's still a good idea. And I thought to myself, what is functionally the difference? If the God of the universe, who designed us, who is the wisest being ever conceived of, says this is a good idea, and we don't do it, I mean, functionally, what's the difference between that and sin? Not because I think there's a moral impairment, but because I think sometimes we think too much about sin in, in moral terms that we're so like afraid of, okay, it, did I break a rule? Did I not? And we forget that, no, sin is just like breaking the good way to live. Yeah, I, I absolutely resonate with this. My early life understanding of the concept of sin was that it was breaking a rule, right? Yeah. There's a rule and I'm, I'm not doing it and that's sin. So if I'm mad at you and I kick you in the shins, I'm not supposed to kick you in the shins and so I sinned. If I flip off a driver when I'm driving down the street because he or she is being an idiot, which I have not done, but, you know, I've thought about it, <laughs> that is not, al not allowed. That's not Christian behavior. Let's say that, right? Does that phrase mean something to you? That's not oh, yeah. Christian behavior. For sure. And at some point in my church that I worked at in Boston— one of the wonderful things that happens when nobody is a Christian that comes to your church is you have to start explaining things. Oh, And this sure. is a two-edged sword, because once you land on an explanation in layman's terms, it is both enlightening and obscuring of various details about the thing you're talking about. Mm. And you, you always just have to be open to your layman's term definition being adjusted. But because of what sin means in the New Testament, we started just using the simple phrase, uh, you're missing God's mark for your life. God has a way he wants you to live life, and it's just missing the mark to do that. And it's amazing how many things I wouldn't normally think of as sin, but if I think, like for example, Let's take your Sabbath thing. Is it sinful to not take Sabbath? No, 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 no. It's not sinful. Is it missing the mark to not have a regular Sabbath habit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly it. So therefore, do we have a wrong conception of sin? Because is sin simply just missing the mark. I mean, that's what the literal definition of the word sin is, missing the mark. And so I'm very, very tempted to just say, oh, then we need to camp out right there. And in some ways I find that helpful. But just like you said, it's layman's terms. It's a little too simple and we miss some of the nuance if we just camp out there. And I really appreciate, I had all of this in mind and I started listening to John Oswalt's lectures on Isaiah. And I think you've already listened to these. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. He does a great job. I'm only a couple of lectures in. So I, I've liked what I've heard so far. Maybe I should put it that way. And one of the things he says is, look, in Isaiah, at least, and, and all throughout the Bible, 
there are three different words that capture this idea of sin. One is the word sin, which, as we've said, just means miss the mark. But another word that he uses is rebellion. And that's found all throughout the Bible, but particularly in Isaiah, this idea of being in rebellion against God. And then there's this other word that I'm really struggling to remember, but it's something about being sinful, being depraved, being a person that is unrighteous. And that is just a general state of being, or maybe it's even this anthropomorphic big ticket sin or evil that exists in the world. And so there are lots of different ways that the Bible talks about sin, and it's not just as easy as, did I miss the mark or not? Does that broaden it out sufficiently for you? It's a great point, because you're absolutely right. I mean, there are moments when Paul talks about the sinful nature as if we should treat our own sinful nature as if it were a thing that is separate from us. Mm-hmm. You know, but, no, no, that wasn't me. That was my sinful nature. Adds an interesting dynamic that there is a sense of a spiritual reality that is present in my life that I wrestle against. And that that is on some level an expression of the broader spiritual reality that is at work in the world at large that we are wrestling against on that level as well. I think that's a great way to broaden it out. And so sometimes I feel like we get really caught in, is this a moral thing or not? Rather than asking the question, is this a healthy thing or not? Is this in keeping with what God wants for me or not? And I think Mm. that that's a helpful thing. And I think it's also helpful in terms of wrestling with our sinful nature. I think it's uh, helpful in helping us to avoid open rebellion. Like I, I think that thought process is far different than, oh, well, see, the New Testament didn't require that we keep Sabbath, so it's not a moral thing, so we don't have to. Wait a minute. I think we just went completely off track. You know, I think you hit on two things. If I'm asking, what does God want for me versus is this sinful? When I relate to God in the is this sinful paradigm, God is distant. When I relate to God asking the question, even just, God, what do you want from me regarding this? How do you want me to relate to this thing? How would you guide me in this moment? My mind has the space for God to be a lot closer. Yeah, I love the idea of God's proximity to this. Uh, I think if we think about the Christian walk as an invitation to a personal relationship with Christ, then I think we've started forming our minds in the right direction. We can start asking questions around these points of decision with God, and it's a conversation with God. And that nearness is really vital to say, okay, how would you have me live? But I want to ask you about a phrase that you Calvinists, okay, well, I say you Calvinists, I think you you grew up pretty Calvinist leaning, and I think you've softened over time. But I still throw you in that camp just because I like to hate on you. You Calvinists really love this concept of total depravity. That is, it's one of, it's the tea in tulip. Uh, yep. Y'all start there. So how would you put this idea of total depravity into all that we're talking about? Because to me, that sense of total depravity, emotionally, mentally, sometimes even spiritually, robs me of my ability to realize that God is near, that I can make decisions with God, that I have that communal relationship with him, because total depravity feels like I'm worthless. I I have no way of connecting with God. I have no, you know, I just have to sit back and obey is kind of how it feels. So how would you put them together? Yeah, absolutely. So I am not a pure Calvinist, as you said. I just, in this meeting with the pastor that I was talking to, he asked where I was at on this spectrum. And I said, I'm a theological mess. And (laughs) that sort of, that's just the truth. I, I, I think when we deal with 
transcendent realities, the grave danger is to over systematize. Um, mm. But that's a conversation for a different day. But here is what I would take total depravity to mean. And in all honesty, I can say all this with my head, but some parts of it don't sink into my self awareness or my heart. And maybe that's the struggle here. But the idea of total depravity is not that every action that I take is horribly wrong. The idea of total depravity is that everything about me left to my own devices is corrupted. I can't go so deep within myself that I find an uncorrupted element within me. You know, like I, I sometimes hear people say, well, don't trust your emotions. And what they're sometimes implying is, but do trust your thinking as if your emotions were corrupt, but your thinking is not corrupt. <laughs> Total depravity means, no, no, no. My heart is corrupt and my mind is corrupt and my will is corrupt. Everything there is. So total it means all elements within me are corrupt. And therefore, I am desperately in need of Jesus. There is no alternative option. And I think this is where, on some level, Christians are no longer totally depraved because the Holy Spirit has taken residence in their lives. And so there is something within them that is not corrupt. Now, that doesn't mean that like I'm now a good person and before I was a bad person. It means that, again, this if you think of this idea of parts, my mind, my will, whatever, are in the process of being transformed by the perfect and flawless spirit that lives within me and he is perfect within me, and he taking residence in me means I am not totally depraved because he is there. You know, it reminds me, you're talking about this idea of being transformed, and not that every part of us is immediately redeemed, but that Christ comes in and begins the process of redeeming us. And this idea of total depravity actually really comes home for me when I realize that there are habits of sinfulness that literally dwell in my body and in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, J.P. Moreland has this great analogy where he uses tennis. And he says, look, if I show up at the tennis court, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't play tennis. And so when I go to do a forehand or a backhand or whatever, I have tennis unrighteousness. I do it poorly, and I need to be trained in tennis righteousness, the right form and the right muscle movements, and I need to do it over and over and over so that I can teach my body to unlearn the patterns of tennis unrighteousness and to put on or to learn the habits of tennis righteousness. And it's those repetitive behaviors, those ways of living in the world, those ways of thinking that remain in us until they are fully transformed by the presence of Christ in us. And I recognize this total depravity in myself when I discover a new unconscious, I always behave that way. Huh, that's something that needs a little bit of redemption from Jesus. All right, mm. God, let's start working on this together. Like you said, there's no part of you that's untouched by unrighteousness. And so you just keep discovering all of these sinful patterns that have to be unlearned and you need to be trained in righteousness to replace it. Well, and this brings us, I think, to one of the questions that I have often had that is one of the things I said in last week's episode. Andy Kolber, did I say her name right? I never say her name right. That's that's how I pronounce it. So we okay, could be wrong Andy together. Kolber. Well, no, no. I mean, I really mess it up. I want to call her Andy Kolberg- sometimes, which is clearly not correct. But she talks a lot about the idea of compassionate attention, paying attention to yourself, your reactions, your thoughts, your feelings, all of what's going on inside of you in a way that is offering yourself compassion rather than offering yourself judgment. And there's a gentleness to that 
that is different from how I was taught to deal with sin in my own life, but that I think offers a way to actual transformation. You know, you just talked about noticing patterns and habits within yourself. You will notice far more of those if you pay compassionate attention to what's going on inside yourself than if you knee-jerk respond to everything that you think is happening inside of yourself. Do you agree? Well, okay, so I actually really, really agree. But I'm going to stop and address the voices in my head for a moment and Mm. play a tape out loud for you because I've got tapes in my head of my upbringing and my uh, the way I was taught to relate to sin. And there is a big part of me. There's this voice in my head that says, hang on, if you take the therapeutic approach, you are downgrading the severity of sin. You're not taking it seriously. You're not recognizing your need to actually repent, not just get some therapy. You have to get right with Jesus. You have to take on his righteousness. You have to confess your sin. That is part of the formula. And if you leave it behind, you're leaving the gospel behind. And I don't think you're saying that, but I want you to tell me why you're not saying that. Man, that's really good. That is a tape that has played in my head a million times. And I have a thousand thoughts about that. One is you have to repent is one thing you said, by which we really mean I need to go say I'm sorry to Jesus. Whereas what I think repentance really means is change your life. And we are talking about a way in which we actually can do that. <laughs> okay. Well said. Point point four, Missouri. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that you said that I thought was exactly the tape that plays in our heads all the time is that we are somehow being soft on sin. Is that what you said? Yeah. Because I've had this conversation twice in the last two weeks where I was talking about Christians who were dealing with pornography in particular, and how they, if they work for a Christian organization, they're afraid to admit that because they could lose their job because the response is that they often get fired and thereby lose their livelihood and sometimes their community. And in both of these conversations, I was advocating for a more transformative approach that gives these folks an opportunity to actually experience the healing that they need to experience. And in both conversations, I had to pause and say, not that I'm okay with that behavior. Like I had to have this moment where I paused and made sure it was clear that I was orthodox and hold to a high enough standard of holiness because the minute you start talking in this kind of therapeutic way about certain things, it is possible that the person you're listening to or talking with is going to start judging you as soft on sin. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what I think we're really saying is we believe transformation happens from the inside out. And so we are not just trying to change somebody's behavior. We're trying to say change somebody's very being. And that that requires a more robust approach than stop it. Yes. Well, and here's the thing. Good counseling offers a safe place where you can come face to face with your own life and start mm-hmm. living in a healthier place. And that is what Jesus did for us by forgiving our sins. He took the first mm-hmm. step and said, I will pay the penalty. I will forgive your sins. I will give you the space, the grace, the freedom, the patience, and the help you need to change your life. I will do that. Now come to me and let's work on this together. That's not therapeutic. That's the gospel. 
I mean, not that they're antithetical, but I'm saying it's not just pure therapy talk. This is the gospel. That is the good news. Yes, you are sinful. Yes, you have no hope. Yes, every part of you is covered in this sin nature, and it infects everything. I've got a plan for that. I can remove that. And then together, we can work on developing my righteousness in you. Absolutely. Well, and if we come back to our early missing the mark, so often what I feel like happens is people need tools to get back on target. Hmm. The fact that they acknowledge that they need help or tools should not penalize them. I I mean, if I want to get on target and stay on target, I need a lot. I need wise thinkers who have written books, and I need close friends who can help me live and process. I need mentors, and I need colleagues, and I need You know, like even just the weight of the conversation that I had this morning with somebody who could potentially be my pastor, I was like, oh, this is a valuable tool because this is serious. I'm having a serious conversation with somebody who is important for my spiritual life. Hmm. And frankly, in case I haven't said it, and I desperately need a therapist. I see my therapist every other week and I am deeply grateful for the role that he plays. And and I think it would be a fascinating conversation at some point in your getting your master's in counseling to talk about the therapist's role in the discipleship process. Mm. I think that's a fascinating conversation. I have lived with a therapist for 20 years, 20, what year is it? 23. So 23 years. I have been in therapy for large chunks of that, for lots of different reasons. But I think as you are exploring the role of the therapist as someone who is stepping into that role, talking about the overlap and lack of overlap of how a pastor and how a therapist operate in a person's discipleship journey is a really interesting part of this. Wow. Yeah. I will let you know when I'm ready to have that conversation. That is probably one of the main things I will be thinking through over this professional training. You know, it's interesting. I I felt like getting an MDiv was getting a master's degree. My first few days of this counseling program feels like, yes, there's a master's degree, but it's professional training. It's just much more practical, much more geared toward doing the job every day down to like, here's one of your assignments. Go look at all of your state licensing regulations and make sure to document them all right here so that I know you know exactly what's required of you. Now go. Oh, okay. Well, that's highly practical. That wasn't just reading three, you know, five theory papers and then telling you what I think. But anyway, as I go through this training, I'm going to be thinking through, okay, I have for a long time thought very pastorally. Now I need to start thinking in terms of a counselor, what stays and what goes when I've got my counselor hat on? That is my main question, at least as it stands today. So it's a good question. I think it's a great question, and I'm glad you're going to be asking it because there are differences in the role. I think there is great value in a pastor whose opinion of you matters, being able to say to you, hey, I think doing that, you're going to be missing the mark. But I'm not sure that's the therapist's job. And I'm not sure I want a therapist to say that to somebody. I don't know that they are the right role in that person's life or that that person is contracting with them. I I don't know that I want somebody getting paid to say that in that exact session by session way. I don't, I am thinking out loud here, but I look forward to that conversation because I think it's fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has been a really good conversation on sin that hopefully I I feel hopeful at the end of it, which is great. I feel like my takeaway, you know, if, if I try to apply our prayer, all right, God, give us good thoughts and then help us to do them. The doing, the action thing for me that I'm taking away from this is partner with Jesus to expose those areas of your life that are still under the habits of sin 
and allow him to help you transform those. Whether that's because you need to go to therapy or you need to connect with your mentor or you need to connect with your spiritual friend or you need to set up some accountability or whatever it is you need to do or whether you just need to sit down in lots of prayer and ask for the Holy Spirit to work through your life. I feel like I've been invited to allow that transformation to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I I have thought several times in this conversation about a book that you've referenced a few times in past conversations, the Sky Jathani book and the idea of being with God. Yeah. And I feel like the invitation is to be acknowledging our sinfulness in a way that allows us to be with God rather than to run from God. Yeah. So good. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me to remind our audience, hey, we're going to be going into a brand new series here starting October 10th. We are going to be reading a book together called Exclusion and Embrace. And what I love about Exclusion and Embrace is it's talking about how to embrace the other. And I think when we talk about this idea of sin, Christians have historically been really good about talking about everybody else's sin. And that helps to make other people very, very other and almost give us an emotional justification for why we don't have to embrace that person and those people. Mm. And so I'm looking forward to going chapter by chapter through Exclusion and Embrace, trying to wrap our head around all of the great theology that Miroslav Volf put in there, and then working on, okay, then how do we live in light of that? How do we embrace the other? As sinful as they are, and as sinful as I am, how do we embrace people with whom we disagree, or we would even necessarily call our enemies? Mm. I am so excited to dig into this because this is such an important topic. We've talked so many times about how we want to be generous to people who think differently. We want to come at discussions with humility. And I think he offers us this opportunity to have a systemic way of thinking that helps us ground that intent in a very intentionally Jesus-oriented way of thinking. And I'm so excited about it. Yeah. So uh, to the audience, if you want to join us in this, feel free to pick up a copy of Exclusion and Embrace. We're going to be going through a chapter a week. And then if you found this episode or any of our other episodes to be valuable, you know somebody that might get some benefit from this conversation, please invite them to this conversation. Send a, a link over to a friend. We want to expand this conversation, and we want people to relate to sin and to God in healthy, good, constructive ways, and, and we we want that conversation to continue. So after you've shared this episode, then join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. Tell us more about your thoughts pertaining to dealing with the fact that we're sinful humans. How does that work out in your life? Yeah, I can't wait to hear what everybody else has to say. It's going to be great. I agree. So, Josh from Missouri, what else have you been thinking about? You know, this kind of relates in some ways to me, but one of the things I've noticed lately, as I am recreating habits and systems and structures in my life, I think I have talked before about the fact that Headspace is an app that I use fairly regularly. It's sort of a secular mindfulness app, and I really appreciate it. And I hadn't used it in probably four or five months. And just this last week, I came back to it. And And the idea of Headspace is just learning to pay attention by practicing to pay attention to your breath. It's always there. It's not stressful. So you can always practice paying attention to that. And so it guides you through a way of paying attention to that, which is very helpful to me. But one of the things that's interesting is whenever I come back to Headspace after an, a long absence, I start to realize 
something about what I have mentally dubbed my own mental culture, meaning the well-being of my brain, in that every time I come back to Headspace, I am invited into this opportunity to pay attention to intrusive thoughts, big intrusive thoughts, little intrusive thoughts, and my awareness of those intrusive thoughts and my ability to let go of them and return my attention to what I want to focus on is so bad (laughs) when I first come back that I'm just like, oh, my mental culture is horrible. And I was saying this to my wife, it takes about a week to a week and a half of doing Headspace every day for me to get to a reasonable space where I am able to be mindful of my own thoughts and have some level of ability to let go of them and redirect my own attention. And those are for both the spiritual life and just everyday living, really, really important skills. And so Mm. I am intrigued by this idea of mental culture. And again, I don't know that that's really the best phrase for it. It's just what I call it in my own head. And I am grateful for apps like Headspace that train good mindfulness into those of us who are looking to benefit from that. That's cool. I'm so glad uh, you have that tool and that you engage that tool. Yeah. Nice. Very helpful. What about you? What else have you been thinking about? Well, you've already referenced a couple of different times books that I have suggested or books that I have mentioned, but I got to turn the tables and say, I am reading a Brandon Sanderson book. Oh, look at that. Yeah. You are finally falling from grace. Uh, (laughs) uh, Yeah, it does feel a little shameful to admit it. Um, I imagine your wife listening to this right now going, oh, great, not another one. Uh, (laughs) But Well, hopefully for her, you hate it and, and you'll never touch another book again by him. Yeah, so I'm reading Tress of the Emerald Sea as because you told me, if you ever listen to the Mars Hill podcast, that I had to listen to a Brandon Sanderson book. And you said the one to start on is Tress of the Emerald Sea. Mm-hmm. And I've actually been listening to it. And I think I've enjoyed it. There have been times where I wanted more out of the plot. But the snarky, sarcastic nature of the narrator not the audio book narrator, but the, the, the in-world narrator, the in-world narrator. Yeah. Sanderson built the book or wrote the book from the perspective of a narrator. And that narrator has a lot of attitude and snide remarks and is rather a goofy character. And so I actually kind of like that. I feel like it's a little overdone at times, but for the most part, it's entertaining. And finally, I'm, I don't know, about 70% of the way through the book. And I feel like the plot has gotten enough teeth finally to like, it can go on its own merits and I don't rely on the snarkiness to get me through. But overall, it's been a fun and entertaining book. And I think I would read another one. I just, I'll have to see how the last 30% of this goes. It's going to seal it one way or the other. Yeah, I'm super curious And I don't want to say too much until you are done with the book, because I can't remember what is revealed at what point and and how all the various pieces of it go. But I will at least ask what you think of his world building, because one of the things I love about him is that he makes some really creative stuff up. And Tress is a great example of this. Yes. Yeah. The fact that they don't have regular oceans, they have a sea of spores that upon contact with moisture do a variety of wicked and dark things is fascinating. And the fact that he, he set the entire book on a ship sailing the 12 spore seas. I don't know. That's next level weird. Who has a brain that works that way? I don't know. So yeah, his world building is, is interesting. And I like the way that he kind of assumes the world and just kind of starts the story 
and unveils characteristics of the world as it goes along. So it's not like he spends so much upfront time building the world so that you can even orient yourself. He allows you to orient immediately to the character and allows them to explore their world and you get to learn about it through their eyes. So it it unfolds slowly, which is nice. And I don't have to sit there and try to understand it all at the beginning. Though it does contribute to that first 70% of the fact that he stretches that out, the world exploration does contribute to this thing that you mentioned earlier that it takes a while for the plot to get going. Because there is this vibe of, I'm just wandering around in a very interesting world, and let me see it. And then there comes this moment where the plot kicks in. So is that consistent throughout his other books? Um, Tress is significantly shorter than most of his books. Most of his books are three times longer than that. But yes, he makes up these very weird worlds, and he is very interested in slowly unveiling them to you. And then making all these subtle promises that you didn't even know he was making that all pay off at the exact same time. And so there comes a moment at the end of many of his books where you just go, oh, wait, 65 things just happened. Okay. Okay. And well, then I will look forward to the ending of this book. Like I said, if he, if that kind of awesome storytelling pays off like that, and I've been catching things that I didn't know I've been catching, then... I think it'll make me want to read another one. Yeah, I'll be curious. So you got to got to let me know once you finish, but that's super exciting that you are reading Press of the Emerald Sea, which is a great, great book. Okay. Well, that brings us to the Witch Josh question. Ooh, Witch Josh. I almost had, I got so excited about the Tress thing that I forgot we had one more thing to do. Um <laughs> But, well, you know, we so, could skip it. No, it's okay. Today's Witch Josh, if I remember correctly, is Witch Josh doesn't have a favorite Bible verse. Yeah, that is me. I really don't. I grew up loving Romans 8, 38, and 39, you know, for who can separate us from the love of God, you know, all these things. None of them. Uh, he just loves us so much. Great verse. I know lots of people that have that as their favorite verse. No problem in having that as your favorite verse. It, over time, lost a lot of its luster because kind of like what you were talking about earlier, the second you boil everything down to just a layman's term saying, you eliminate a lot of the nuance and you have to be open for it to change. And those are two verses that are absolutely true out of a whole lot of verses that are also absolutely true. And so let's, let's expand, let's nuance this, let's think this all through. So as, as I started to do some of that work about expanding and nuancing, I realized neither that verse nor any other verse captures all the nuance and, Mm. and puts it all together. And so I'm like, I don't have a favorite verse. Like I just like the Bible. I like all that it teaches. But the second I focus in on just one verse I feel like I've lost 15 others. So yeah, I just don't have a favorite verse. And I and that feels awkward. I feel like, oh, maybe I'm not doing this right, but I don't have a favorite verse. Well, the good news is there's nothing super spiritual about sitting here and saying, oh, I don't have a favorite verse because I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have a favorite verse, by the way? I have two that I come back to regularly favorite is weird language about this, but there are two verses I come back to and they, they actually sort of connect with one another a little bit. One is Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. That's the first verse that ever captured my heart. I remember the first time I read it and I sat with it for like an hour, just reading it over and over and over again, because I was so blown away by the view of God that it it offers. And then the other one that is sort of, if I had a life verse, it would be 1 Thessalonians 5.21, which simply says, test everything, hold on to the good. Mm. And I want to engage in that kind of a conversation and that kind of a life, that I am welcoming all sorts of input, but I am welcoming them 
critically, not in the sense of I'm criticizing them, but in the sense that I am thinking intelligently about everything that I listen to and hear. Hmm. Uh, so those are great verses. I like them. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to have another test to everything conversation next week? Let's do it. I can't wait. I'll talk to you then. Okay. Bye.